Hello, this is Barry. Thank you for joining us online. We'll get to the next message in our Better Than Happy series shortly, but I wanted to take a little bit of time to invite you to join with us as we're trying to reach more people with the life-changing uh, gospel of Jesus. Our church and our online ministry is growing, and every number has a name, and every name has a story, and every story is important to God. Would you consider giving so that we can help more people meet, know, and follow Jesus? If you'd like to help us, go to gracepointkitsapp.com slash give. Thank you so much. What's up? <laughs> I said that in first service and they answered back, good morning, you know? <laughs> Those first service people, they don't miss a beat, man. They don't miss a beat. Uh, I'm grateful to be here to open the word with you guys this morning. Uh, I got a question for you guys. Are you content? Are you a content person? What are the situations in your life that make you content? What is your happy place? What is that place that you go to um, in order to feel like you are in a content place. And as you go there in your soul, um, in your Bibles, I would like it if you could open up to Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. That's where we're going to be at today, and we're going we're gonna to kind of look at that. But before we jump into the Word, I would like to start off with a story. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my friend Juan. Uh, Juan was one of the very first people to ever, one of the very first students to ever come to my very first youth group when I became a youth pastor 11 years ago, right? And, uh, and, and Juan was a special type of crazy. He was like a feral human being, right? And he had like a crew that ran with him, and they were, they were less like a crew of people and more like a herd, like when they would enter, they would wreck a place, and then they would move to the next room and wreck that place. And, uh, and his crew came from a place called Mo uh, Old's Mobile Home Park. Old's Mobile Home Park. And they would tell me, what happens in Old's Mobile Home Park stays in Mo Old's Mobile Home Park. And um, I thought they were joking about that until I dropped one off one day. And I can't tell you what happened because, you know, what happens in old mobile home park. <laughs> but it was mildly inappropriate. Um, Juan wasn't just crazy. He was weird. Juan was a weird person. Uh, he was one of those weird people who sort of embraced their weirdness, you know. Juan's favorite joke was to say something totally random and sometimes off-putting and then to watch you react, and then he would laugh at you, right? Like, like, like ha, 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 look at what I did to you. And I'm like, I'm not sure what you just did to me, but please stop. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that. Because we have a, a God who loves to take the outcast and bring them close, to bring them into the fold of God, um, I got to watch Juan accept Christ and become a Christian. And uh, it was an amazing experience. As he grew in his faith, um, I watched uh, a beautiful faith develop, a beautiful faith. And it was crazy how consistent his faith grew, given how crazy his life was. Everything around him seemed to kind of like fall apart. I watched his family sort of fall apart. I watched his friends, you know, those, that herd that he ran through, they all made initial claims to Christ. And then slowly, each and every one of them sort of walked away from it. But Juan remained consistent. Juan remained consistent in his faith and consistent in his weirdness, right? <laughs> I remember Juan, we were playing uh, Frisbee golf. It wasn't disc golf because disc golf, we were actually playing with Frisbees. And we were at a hole, and Juan approached everything he did with a crazy amount of enthusiasm. Not skill, but enthusiasm, <laughs> right? And so one hole, he gets back and he just, he just lets it go and he lets out this belt and he's like, Aah! but one thing happened is the Frisbee got stuck on his finger, right? And so instead of going forward, it went, he's aiming this way, it went that way. 
and it just flew all the way across the, the highway. And we looked at one, and we were like kind of laughing. We were like, what was that about? And straight face looked back at us and went, the devil tickled me. <laughs> what? You love that type of stuff. Juan grew in his weirdness, and he grew in his faith. And I watched as a life that shouldn't have been a content life become a very content life because Juan knew Jesus. When you get close to someone, you start to sort of resemble them. And this is sort of what just happened at youth group one day. <laughs> He's like my big Mexican son right there, you know? And uh, Juan, um, Juan grew in his faith, and then he came to me one day and said, I want to go to Bible college, and I want to go to the Bible college that you went to, and, um, and I would like it if uh, you drop me off at school when I go to college. And I was like, of course I'll drop you off at school, Juan. Like, of course I'll do that. So I'm dropping him off at Multnomah, which is in Portland, which is a great place for weird people. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, I, I'm dropping him off, and I'm, I'm like a proud papa. I'm like, my emotions are kind of going crazy. And Juan comes rolling into campus, with everything he owns in a big black trash bag around his back, right, like this, right here. And I don't have to tell you guys this, but that's not usually the type of person that rolls into a Bible college, right? And so he, we go into his dorm, and he's going to meet his roommate for the first time. And me and Juan come rolling in, and we see his roommate. And his roommate, I don't know if he was homeschooled, but... Let's just say he looked inexperienced to be handling. <laughs> and he had two parents there who looked real nice, you know? Um, and Juan looks at him, drops his bag of stuff, goes up to this, this, this young man, grabs him, picks him up, and then whispers in his ear, hello, brother. <laughs> His parents look scared, <laughs> and, and they, they left, um, probably trying to go talk to some academic dean somewhere. Um, and so it was just me and Juan in his room with his bag of stuff. And uh, one of the things that I didn't tell you about Juan is that Juan grew up a little poor, of course, you know, from a mobile home park. But Juan's house, um, he didn't have his own bedroom. And so Juan slept on a couch from the time he was a little boy until the time he went to college. So this was Juan's bed. And I see Juan look around the room, and then all of a sudden kind of go quiet and look at his bed. And I'm like, what is Juan doing? And then I realize this is the first time in Juan's life that he's had a bed. This is, a, this is his first bed. And I start to cry. And I can't even hold it. I can't even hold it in, right? And Juan looks back at me. He's not crying, you know? He's like, are you okay? <laughs> Pastor, do you need a second? I, I try to get something out. Just, this is bed and couch, you know, you know? It's like, it's like, all right. So I, I dismiss myself, and I, and I leave Juan that day um, at college, praising God for a God who brings those who are in the outcast close to him. The God who turns couches into beds. When I think of Juan, I, I think of these scriptures that we're going to be looking in today. Verses 10 through 11 of Philippians chapter 4 say, say this. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. I, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned. If you have a physical Bible underlined, I have learned. Whatever situation I am to be content. I have learned to be content. I have learned to be content. I want to suggest that you can learn to be content. You can learn to be content. Oftentimes, we kind of think that our personalities kind of determine all we are in life. And a lot of us just kind of surrender to whatever personality we've been given. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, there's certain personalities 
that are a little more content than other personalities. You know, there's the panic button personalities, right? That the littlest thing goes wrong and they are hitting that panic button, right? Like they're just, ah, 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 they get all worked up and they can't imagine how they're going to proceed if the plan didn't go exactly the way they wanted it to go. You know, those guys are always like one step from pulling the fire alarm, right? I see some of you guys like looking at people in this room like right now. (laughs) If that really is a panic button personality, don't look at them, okay? (laughs) We don't need the fire alarm going off. And then there's those other people, right, who are on the complete opposite side of the spectrum. They're like too chill to function, right? Like, you could be, you could be, you could see, like, their house on fire, run inside, and they're just sitting on their couch. Be like, man, your house is on fire. And they're like, bro, just calm down. You're just stressing right now. <laughs> I can't have that in my life. I got to have, like, positive energy. Dude, I'm serious, man. If you don't get out of here, you're going to die. Man, again, with this stress level, okay, man, just <laughs> calm it down. I'm like, I just want you to get out of the house, you know? Like, but you could have said it differently, you know? So you have the panic button personality and you have the too chill to function personality. And then you have all of us, right? Everybody else falls somewhere on that spectrum. Everyone else falls somewhere on that spectrum. But here's the thing that we oftentimes neglect is that no matter where we start out, we can always make a choice to change and to move closer to being a more content person. Whether we're a panic button or a chill person, we can always make steps to become a more content person. You aren't just who you are today. You can change. I think our culture has promoted this idea that you can't change. You just are who you are. And I would just say, man, if anybody tells you you can't change, don't listen to them because they're trying to sell you something. And also, if, if people tell you that change is easy, don't listen, to you, don't listen to them either because they're also trying to sell you something. Because the truth is this. Change is possible, but change is hard. Change is possible, but change is hard. And if you're going to make a decision to be a more content person, if you're going to make a decision to to find the joy that's offered in Christ, that is going to be a journey that will be rough. Because every step you take forward, every step you take to being a more content person, There are so many obstacles coming at us. And the first place that we encounter obstacles are inside of ourselves. We have all sorts, if we're honest, we're not crazy, but we have all sorts of voices inside of us telling us not to be content people. Depression, anxiety, doubt, self-doubt, self-esteem issues insecurities. Every single one of us is walking through this door with some type of internal voice that is leading to discontentment. Each and every one of us has those internal voices, those internal voices that say, don't be content. And if we're going to choose contentment, if we're going to choose to change, to be different, to be something else, then we have to first address the voices that are on the inside. If, If you are a person who struggles with some of those things, And this should be good news to you. This should be gospel to you. You can change. It's not going to be easy. But in Christ, you can change. Let's jump back into our text real quick. I love this. I know know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. You have a physical Bible or a Bible app, go ahead and highlight circumstance. Circumstance. And if you didn't get that, that was in Philippians 4.12. What I want to suggest this morning is this. Let me be real simple. Being content does not have to be about circumstances. Being content 
does not have to be about circumstances. But if we're honest, there's a lot of external voices, there's a lot of external realities that want to steal our contentment. They want to steal our joy. They want to take it from us. And, and, and it makes sense. It's really simple logic, right? Like, when good things are going on, when I'm on vacation, when I, when I have my finances in order, when everything's good, that's a place that I can be content, right? That's a, good things happen, I can be content. And then, and, then, and then the other side of that is there's bad things, there's bad realities that happen in our world. And if we're honest, there are all sorts of external things coming at us that say, don't be content. Man, just turn on the news this week, Right? Probably even in this room, we're, we're, we're not united on a lot of issues. We're, we're divided. And when we, we see how divided we are, man, it goes, man, I, I don't know how to deal with this, God. I don't, I don't, know, how to, I don't know how to take this in, right? I don't, I don't really get it, you know? We're a divided country. That's an external reality that'll steal your content. I often, as a youth pastor, I think about other external realities that steal my, my, my joy, I think about like how our students are becoming more social online and more anti-social in person. And that scares me. That scares me. It's like an external reality. I'm like, oh my gosh, how are we gonna, how are we gonna get through this thing? How are we gonna do this? The other thing I see a lot of is, is that we are increasingly becoming a nation of fatherless children. And as a youth pastor for the last 11 years, I've worked, I've worked so much with students, including Juan, whose fathers were not in the home. They just weren't there. And if we were to poll everybody here today, if we were to take a poll, then more than half, the majority of us, would, would claim to have some sort of dad pain, some sort of father pain that is in the middle of our hearts. And I think about that like, man, how, how are we going to fix this? This is, this is scary. This is a scary reality that steals my joy. And we, and we think about all of those bad things, and it's hard to be happy. And the world will say, you know how you be happy even when there's bad things? Is what you do is you turn your back to them. What you do is, and I've heard this because it's, it's talked about in the language of positivity, positivity, right? It's like, I'm just going to surround myself with positive influences. I'm just going to remember the good things about life. And, if, and if, if I can just surround myself with good voices and good people and good circumstances, then I can be content. And here's the thing is, you might be personally content, but it's kind of a lie because those bad things are still going on. And when good people turn their backs to bad things, bad things just get worse, They just get worse. So there has to be a place, there has to be a place where where we can acknowledge both the bad and the good things of life and we can find a place where we don't have to shut our ears off. We don't have to shut shut down. Where we can be content. Man, do you ever just want to just shut it all off, you know? Just, man, I'm not watching TV anymore. I'm not going to read Facebook anymore. I'm, I'm not going to, you know what? Maybe the Amish are right, you know? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. I'm going to just, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go build a wicker cabinet. I'm going to do that <laughs> right now. That wasn't in my notes, the wicker cabinet. <laughs> it was a good idea. We need more wicker cabinets. has to be a place where we can acknowledge both the bad and the good things in life. If we as Christians aren't willing to call evil evil, then who will? Then who will? Um, so one of the things I, I think we have to do, I think that one of the things, one of the, one of the strategies for being a more content person, this is, this is step one in, in becoming a more content person, I think it's this. Being content is about being refined, not defined by your problems. Being content is about being refined, not defined by your problems. We all, we all don't want to spend time in the bad things of life. We don't, we don't want to spend time here. But it is so important for us, especially the us who know Christ, to look at the hard things of life and accept them. 
Accept the ones that are on the inside and accept the ones that are on the outside. But the Bible has a different perspective on hard things that happen to us in our lives. It has a completely different perspective than most any place you're ever going to go. Most places are just avoid bad things. That's a good philosophy in life, avoid bad things. The Bible says, consider it all joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know, by the testing of your faith, it brings about endurance. See, guys, that's how we refine ourselves. We see the bad stuff. We see the evil in the world. We see the hard things. We, we listen to the voices that are inside of us. And we use those to guide us through this dark life. We use those to understand that there is evil, there is darkness, there is pain. And if we use it to refine ourselves, then it actually pushes us. It actually propels us towards contentment without having to turn our back on the contentment. Right? And that's who Jesus was. He was perfect in every way, but he didn't just live this kind of like cloud life, did he? He walked with us. He experienced the brokenness of this world. He experienced the pain of this world. And thank God he did not just ignore our human brokenness, but he suffered to save us from it. He suffered to save us from it. Are you a person today who's allowed yourself to be defined by your problems. Maybe it's, maybe you got a good reason why you're not content. And maybe a lot of people would understand that. But you will waste your life, a life that God said is precious and is a gift. You will waste your life if all you ever do is spend every single minute in that bad stuff and allowing yourself to be victimized by it. I remember um, when I was, uh, I was on my very first mission trip. Um, and on this mission trip, some amazing things happened. Some amazing things happened. Like, um, one of the most amazing things on this mission trip that happened for me was I got called to the ministry. I heard God's voice calling me to be a youth pastor specifically. And we did some amazing things, and, but we're all on this bus, and we're headed home after we saw the hand of God. Anybody ever been there where you, you had this amazing moment with God, but you're on the way back? You're on your way down the mountaintop? And I remember I was down, on the way down the mountaintop. We were, we, were, we were on this bus, and I looked around, and I, I could tell that every single person was feeling the exact same thing. We were all just depressed that it was over, right? Everyone's just really sad and really just depressed. And it was really, I thought, you know what? I can fix this situation. I got called to be a youth pastor on this trip. What do youth pastors do? They talk. So what I need to do is I need to just, I need to, I need to preach right now. This, this is what needs to happen. I'm going to get up there and I'm going I'm to let them have it. I'm going to let them know. I'm going to let them know that, 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 that we can get through this. We don't have to just live in depression, all right? So I go up to the front, all proud. I grab that little CB thing that makes the announcements on the bus, right? And I start to just, I start to just preach, you know, like my first sermon ever, basically. And I'm like, I'm like, what God did on that trip was so great, but why does it have to end now? We're just going to take it home with us. And you know what? We're going to be a family. We have our families, but this is going to be family. You know, we're going to be so close. No one's going to be able to divide us. We're going to hit the ground running. We, on this bus, are the best thing that ever happened to the world because we're going to change the world right here. And, and, I, and I love you guys. You know, I love you. And I'm just like crying. Everything's coming down. Right? And then someone goes, hey, TJ. And I go, what? He goes, we can't hear a word you're saying because you got that mic way too close to your face. <laughs> I give up. I sat back down, and I lived in my depression, right? I lived, I lived in, that, in, that, in the sadness of the moment. Again, guys, we spend so much time trying to fix the brokenness of our situations. What we need to do is accept it. We need to accept that the, both bad things and good things happen. And, and instead of seeing our, the bad things as something we can ignore or live inside of, we need to see them as something that can refine us. There's a season for everything. 
jump back into the word. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things, my version says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If you got a Bible, underline, I can do all things. I can do all things. Raise your hand if you've heard this verse before, most of you guys. Raise your hand if you call this one of your favorite verses. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, I'm, I'm about to ruin that for you. Um, <laughs> hopefully not. Oftentimes, we see this verse in the wrong way. We see it as a self-empowering verse because we really like that first part of it. We really like, I can do all things, right? That's like a beat your chest kind of moment right there. Me doing anything, that is awesome. I'm going to do it. You know, you always see it at like, at like Christian-themed gyms, you know? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Today, bro, I'm going to put up two plates. Never done that before, but today I can do all things <laughs> through Christ who strengthens me. You see football players, you know, and I don't want to diss on them, but oftentimes, man, it's like I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, the other team had people saying the same thing, you know, <laughs> like where's their theology going to go? It's going to wind out of control is what's going to happen, right? And, and, and the thing is we like the first part, but we kind of ignore the second part. I can do all things through through him who strengthens. Through him who strengthens. This is not a self-empowering verse. This is a self-denial verse. This is a verse where you say, I am submitted to your power, not my own power, God. And, and, and the context supports that it's not really even about being able to do superhero awesome things. The context is talking about us being content. And whatever situation is thrown our way. That's where Paul's at with this. He's saying, I, when I got stuff, I've, I've, I've lived in abundance. I've lived when I needed to be hungry. And I've learned the secret to being content. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I want to suggest this morning, this verse is, is, is really talking about this. True contentment is being in a relationship with God. True contentment is being in a relationship with God. That is, that's it. That's the Christian faith summed up right there, guys. Maybe you walked in today and, and you don't know Jesus. You, you're just trying this thing out. This is what you should take with you today. If you want to be content, that's only found in a relationship with God. That's only found in a relationship with Jesus. How? How? How does having a relationship with Jesus make me a more content person? Because that sounds like a super churchy answer, right? What's the answer? Jesus, obviously. We're in church, right? But how? How does that work? Well, here's the first thing. When you have a relationship with Jesus, you have a purpose in life. There's so many people walking around without purpose. There's so many people asking, what does it all mean? What, what's, why is this happening? What's going on? There's so many people who are lost because, because they don't get it. They don't understand what this thing is called life. And, 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 and because of that, they just spend their time to sort of spinning their wheels. When you say yes to Jesus, you're submitting to a higher power and you're allowing that authority to dictate your days, which means you have a purpose. You have a mission. Every day you wake up, you should have a personal mission. You should have a personal, this is what God's doing in my life today. And you should have, as a church, we have a, we have a big mission, right? Meet, no, follow Jesus. You have a purpose. In, in a good relationship with God, you can find contentment because not only do you have a purpose, but you have a friend. You have a friend. I remember when I first became a Christian, the big thing that was going on in my life was all my friends sort of deserted me. And so God had to become my friend. And I love the verse, right? Jesus is about to get um, crucified. And he sits down his disciples and he's their rabbi and they're his, they're his followers. And, and, he's, and he says to them, he goes, I no longer call you servants because servants don't know their master. They don't know what their master's doing. I now call you friends. Guys, that should be mind-blowing. The God of the universe, the creator of everything, wants to be your friend. In a relationship with God, we can find a father, right? We can find a father. One of the biggest 
one of the biggest songs of the last five years. You're a good, good father. The lyrics aren't incredibly deep, but they're deep because they all hit that father wound. Because so many of us are walking around without good, good fathers. There's so many of us saying, I don't, I don't got it. I don't have that. And that's, that's why all the things that are going on in my life are bad because I got a bad start. Well, guess what? You get a restart with a good, good father, and you can start that today. In a relationship with God, you can find hope, a hope that surpasses this world. When we see the evil that's around this world and we see the suffering that sometimes goes without being held accountable, we can understand that there is a place that is past this world where God will sort out all the details because he's a good judge. And in doing so, when we lose people that we love, we have a hope that that's not the end, right? We have a hope that goes past this world. In a relationship with God, we have a perspective. We have a perspective flip, right? I oh, mean, I, when I watch the news, uh, I feel like our news, all of them, all of them have devolved into this sort of opinions thing, these talking heads opinion. And, and next time you're on any of your news outlets, whichever one you're on, whichever side you're on, just turn the volume down. And what you'll see is a bunch of different heads on the TV. Sometimes they jam like six heads on that TV, right? Just six boxes of heads. And you know what they're all saying? They're not saying news. They're not saying relevant things. They're saying my opinion, my opinion, my perspective, my perspective, my view, my view. Your view is bad, my view is good. That's it. And it's been going on for like years like that. And we can't get enough of it. Guess what, guys? Guess what, Christians? Guess what, people who, who are looking for purpose and looking for a savior? We don't have to worry about what everybody else's perspective is. In Christ, we have a perspective that's higher than this world. We have a God who looks down and says, this is how you're supposed to view the world. I love how C.S. Lewis says it. I believe in God the way I believe that the sun is risen. Not only because I can see it, but by it, I see everything else. By it, I see everything else. That's the perspective, guys. That's the perspective that we get in Christ. We get a, in, in Christ, we get a guide and a guidebook, right? When you feel stuck, when you've got problems, when, when being a parent is tough, when being in a marriage is tough, we have a guide. We have a Bible that says, here you go. And we have a God who, who wants to listen to our problems, and he wants us to listen to him through his word. We have a forgiveness that is deep and that is real. If we are honest, we understand that this world is broken. And we even know that we take it a step further, that our human individual brokenness is what makes our world broken. I am broken too. I am broken too. And if you walk around knowing that you have all of this sort of pent up unforgiveness, whether it's what somebody did to you or you did to somebody else, eventually, if you don't find forgiveness, you, it leads you to corruption. It, it, it leads you to destruction. It leads you to bitterness. In a relationship with God, we have forgiveness that brings about peace and joy and love. And we can move forward in strength even when we're not perfect, even when we know that day when we wake up, we're going to mess up again. But guess what? We still got a forgiver who keeps on forgiving. In a relationship with God, we have a people. We have a people. When I first said yes to Jesus, I don't remember what I prayed I think it was just me introducing myself to God and telling him I needed him. But I knew a couple things just right after I prayed. I knew I had, a, a, a di I had to live my life different, and I knew that I had a people now. I hope that you guys are engaging with Grace Point in a way that you are in a life group. And I hope that your life groups exist in such a way that you fight for each other. That when things are hard, you got people that are holding your head above water and physically being Jesus for you. And I hope that you're giving back to your life group in the same way. And maybe some of you guys don't have that. You need to be that life group. You need to be that person. You need to be that person who gives and gives and gives. Because you have a people. In a relationship with God, the most important thing we have is a savior. 
Amen? If we're honest, which I hope we're being this morning, we are a people that need to be saved. Our problems, our struggles, both internal and external, prove one fact, that we are headed for destruction if we are in charge. Therefore, we need a savior. Maybe this morning, you need to say yes to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you realize you don't have that contentment, you don't have that people, you don't have that forgiveness, you don't have that father, you don't have that purpose. You realize, I don't have any of that stuff. Well, guess what? It's super easy. All you gotta do is just start a relationship. And you start a relationship with God the same way you start a relationship with anybody else. Hi. You just say something. You just say something. And maybe you're a person in this room who you realize that you're a Christian and you know God, but you don't have contentment. You don't have that, content, uh, that contentment that lives in a place that's not just, not just tossed here and there by every little thing that happens in your life. Well, my answer for you is this. You need Jesus too. No matter what side of the cross we are on, the answer is always, I need more Jesus. I need more Jesus. And guess what? Guess what? A relationship with God is continued by just saying something. You need to pray and work some stuff out. I want to return to this story. To my friend Juan. Juan got married this summer. Um, he, uh, yeah, we can clap for Juan. I like that. Oh. He married above his head, way beyond him. Um, uh, he's now uh, at grad school working on his master's degree. He's going to be a family counselor. It's amazing what God does, right? It's amazing what God does. Um, but I want to return to the story of the couch, right? The God who turns couches into beds, right? A couple weeks later, I went to visit Juan. I was going to seminary at the time. I was in my grad school program at the same school he was at. Um, and so I, I got there early one morning. I grabbed McDonald's because McDonald's is obviously me and Juan's passion. Um, <laughs> and I grabbed some McDonald's for him, and I went to his dorm room. And, you know, my plan was just to throw the McDonald's on him and be like, hey, let's have, let's, let's have breakfast, you know, because I knew he'd still be sleeping because college kids don't wake up before noon. Um, and so uh, I walk into his room, and I see his bed is, like, empty. Like, it's not there, right? It's like, and I look at, I look at uh I look at his roommate who just woken up and he looks scared again because you know, I'm in his room again. <laughs> like, where is Juan? He goes, I think Juan's, I think Juan's been sleeping down the, down the hall in another person's room. I'm like, oh, okay. So I walk into that other person's room and I look to my right and there's a person sleeping in a bed there, but it can't be Juan because the shape is not right. It's not big enough. <laughs> um, and I look to my left and again, the shape is not right. It can't be Juan. And then I look straight ahead and Juan had found himself a couch to sleep on. <laughs> He made his way back to the couch, right? And I go up there, I'm mad at him, right? Because God gave you a bed, Juan, you know? And I, and I, and I throw the McDonald's on, I'm like, why are you on the couch, right? And it's just this total trailer park looking moment. McDonald's all over him, he's on a dirty couch. I'm yelling at him, waking his roommates up. It just sounds like, you know, the trailer park came to Multnomah. Um, and, uh, and, and he wakes up and he's like, hey, pastor? He always called me that. Um, hey. And I'm like, why aren't you on your bed? Well, I like sleeping on the couch. I like, I like sleeping on the couch. And I realized it's not about the stuff, is it? It's not about a God who turns a couch into a bed. It's not about the circumstances of our lives. Juan found Jesus, and Jesus was Juan's joy. When I was crying because Juan had a bed, Juan was just wondering, oh my gosh, how am I going to sleep on this thing? We have, to, we have to find a contentment that is outside of our circumstance. And that contentment is in the person of Jesus Christ who doesn't change even when our circumstances do. Amen? Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for the work you're doing in this room. I thank you for... Uh, 
the people who walked into this room today. And, uh, and they, they, they have no idea who you are. But maybe in this moment, they want something of you. God, I pray that you would guide them in their relationship with you. That they would start that conversation today. God, I pray for the people in this room who know you but are still not content. I pray that they would get to know you more. And in getting to know you more, they would find the peace that surpasses all of our, all of our human understanding. And in doing so, they would know contentment. I pray that our church would be a church that's marked by your peace. And when people walk in here, they know it's different. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.